Good afternoon, and thank you everybody for joining us at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars for the latest installment of the Wilson Then and Now series. And thanks to those who logged on early for your patience as we uh, made sure that our live stream was working. The Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars aims to unite the world of ideas to the world of policy by supporting preeminent scholarship and linking that scholarship to issues of concern to officials in Washington. Congress established the center in 1968 as the official national memorial to President Wilson. Unlike the physical monuments in the nation's capital, it is a living memorial whose work and scholarship commemorates, quote, the ideals and concerns of Woodrow Wilson. As both a distinguished scholar and national leader, President Wilson felt strongly that the scholar and the policymaker were engaged in a common enterprise. Today, the center takes seriously his views on the need to bridge the gap between the world of ideas and the world of policy, bringing them into creative contact, enriching the work of both, and enabling each to learn from the other. This particular series, Wilson Then and Now, is our effort to make Wilson and his period more central to that creative contact between ideas and practice in national and global affairs. In a critical and inclusive way, we seek to highlight work on Wilson and his time that offers explicit or implicit lessons for contemporary or enduring problems of public and international life. Today, we are discussing a famous or rather infamous moment in, Wilson, in Wilson's handling of the racial injustice that plagued his America and that his administration helped to exacerbate. His meeting with Boston editor and civil rights advocate, William Monroe Trotter. We also hope to go beyond the Oval Office, however, taking our focus off of Wilson in order to learn about Trotter's long and eventful career and its important legacy for anti-racist politics today. We could not ask for a better guest to guide us than Dr. Carrie Greenidge, who joins us today. Carrie Greenidge is the author of Black Radical, The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter, published in 2019. Listed by the New York Times as one of its top picks of 2019, the book is the first biography written of Trotter in nearly 50 years. Through a contextualized account of Trotter's career, Professor Greenidge's prize-winning book examines Black radical politics and grassroots community protest in the North from the 1880s to the 1930s, moving beyond the Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois dialectic to focus on the work of African Americans who refused to accommodate white prejudice or to be answerable for their politics to a Black elite. Professor Greenidge received her doctorate in American Studies from Boston University and is currently Mellon Assistant Professor in the Department of Studies in Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora at Tufts University, where she also co-directs the African American Trail Project. Her continuing scholarship examines post-Civil War African American and African diasporic politics outside of the South, particularly through popular literature and the transnational Black press. I'm very grateful to be able to welcome her to this episode of our Wilson Then and Now series, not only because she's the perfect guest for our topic, but because she brings back so many fond memories of my time in the Boston area. Those include memories of my former professor, Peter J. Gomes, whose eponymous book award from the Massachusetts Historical Society was one of the awards uh, garnered by Black Radical in 2020. So Professor Greenidge, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And this is great, uh, Trig and everybody at the Wilson Center for inviting me. I know having a book talk and a, a, a webinar in the midst of a pandemic is a hard endeavor. So I, I'm always thankful for everyone who manages to pull it off. Um, welcome everybody. I'm going to today start by giving just a brief introduction on Trotter, uh, his life, and then going to read just a little bit from the book. So we kind of place the Wilson uh, Trotter encounter in context, and then just conclude by talking a little bit about that conflict and then open it up for questions. Uh, William Monroe Trotter was born in Ohio in 1872. He died in Boston in 1934. Um, and during that time period, he founded a newspaper called The Guardian, which um, I argue was sort of the precursor for a radical black press in the United States. And so I'm gonna read briefly just from the introduction to put him in context. Black Radical is the story of an African-American political leader and civil rights agitator who did more than any other newspaper editor of his generation to inspire radical Black consciousness at the turn of the 20th century. 
at a time when the Black press was owned and operated by racial conservatives, Black and white, who stifled Black dissent for the sake of white comfort and racial respectability, Trotter's Guardian galvanized Black working people to recognize and embrace their political power. Unafraid to criticize the Black elite, of which he was a part, he attended Harvard after all, and was raised um, to, uh, uh, by a man who was a federal appointee, even though he was a part of this Black elite, and unintimidated by white opinion or popular approval, Trotter inspired two generations of Black, po black people across the diaspora to demand the civil rights and racial justice promised yet violently denied by emancipation and reconstruction. By 1912, part of that activism that Trotter did uh, was to urge African Americans to uh, encounter politics through what he called a race first rather than a partisan objective. In our current moment, we tend to think of African Americans as switching to or voting Democratic overwhelmingly following the election of uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s. My research would say that's far from the truth and that Trotter was an antecedent to this, but as early as 1900, Trotter was urging, or 1901, Trotter was urging black people, particularly in the North, to vote on a, a nonpartisan race first process. And this is what led him to urge black people to vote for Woodrow Wilson in 1912. And in fact, as my research shows, Wilson's wins in the North, particularly in Massachusetts, and in New Jersey were in some cases responsible for him winning those states. He won over 50,000 um, votes of the black vote, which was the difference between his vote, um, his margin of victory in Massachusetts and in New Jersey. And so when Woodrow Wilson became president and he instituted a segregationist policy, and not just that, and we'll talk about this in discussion, but his, um, his uh, support for rapidly white supremacist members of his cabinet, Trotter led a meeting with the president. And so I'm gonna read, um, get into sort of that meeting, and then we can get more into the details of Trotter's um, uh, career in a moment. When William Monroe Trotter arrived in DC for his meeting in 1914, it became clear that the masses of genteel poor who trusted the Guardian had not lost faith in Trotter. League member and recent Trotter convert, Dr. William Sinclair hosted an anti-segregation rally at the 19th Street Baptist Church in DC where hundreds of black men, women and children cheered as Trotter rose to speak. No doubt Sinclair, a trustee at Howard University who avoided the pompous Monroe when the two were at Harvard together, he was struck by Trotter's candidness. Before the overflowing crowd, he did not minimize the damage done or excuse the administration's policy. Rather, Trotter applauded along with his outraged supporters as Ida B. Wells Barnett spoke about the damage done to the city's colored middle class by Wilson's segregationist policies. Over 30% of African Americans in the district lost their jobs or lost um, access to uh, high playing middle class employment as a result of Wilson's policies. Although Trotter, quote, advised his hearers to withhold judgment of President Wilson until Trotter found a satisfactory solution, Trotter refused to minimize their anger or defend the Democratic administration. Instead, he was adamant that, quote, the separate working tables for colored employees of the Treasury Department are a declaration of foulness, indecency, disease, or essential inferiority by the government itself. Thus, by the time Trotter encountered Woodrow Wilson for the second time in as many years, he met him earlier in 1912 when he was running for president, Trotter's outrage at federal segregation was a populist protest which demanded the support of Massachusetts Democratic congressional delegation, and then relied on over 25,000 black citizens whose petition Trotter handed to the president. When Wilson said that fears of segregation's immediate effects were exaggerated, Trotter showed him an official order from the auditor of the Department of the Interior. The order demanded that black employees be barred from quote, the use of toilets, et cetera, a direct contradiction to Wilson's assurance that his administration was, quote, not hostile to colored people and segregation had not become an administration policy. Apparently, this official document had some effect on Wilson, who said that, quote, no president could ignore such a protest and then shook each man's hand. Trotter left the meeting feeling optimistic, stating that the president, quote, received us very cordially and promised to attend to the uh, league's concerns. But if Wilson and his fellow Democrats expected Trotter and his supporters to react as every other Black delegation to the White House reacted when assured of executive sympathy, he was sorely mistaken. Trotter's protest was a new Negro assault on segregation, discrimination, and inequality, not the old Negro, quote, slouping and pleading that led to Washington's dinner at the White House in 1901. 
Back then, Roosevelt received death threats from white Southerners when he sat with the Tuskegee Booker T. Washington, but he also made a shrewd political gesture that garnered the praise of white paternalists and racial conservatives and contributed to a false memory of Theodore Roosevelt's benign racial paternalism. But Trotter and his new Negro followers could not be so easily pandered to. Over the year, Trotter continued to urge political independence, particularly as it became increasingly clear that despite their pledge of support, Massachusetts Democrats could not be dependent upon any more than the Republicans. In early 1914, Congressman Peters resigned to become Assistant Secretary of the Treasury under Wilson, under the very administrative official, William McAdoo, who pushed the federal segregation the year before. James Michael Curley, a favorite in Black Boston and the mayor of the city, also resigned, although his departure was less dramatic. He left to become Boston's mayor, and his congressional seat was taken over by James A. Galvin, a Democrat. Thus, Trotter planned his second meeting with President Wilson as a demonstration of Black independence power to directly confront white supremacy, even in the face of institutional obstruction. Consequently, the Trotter-Wilson conflict was a proclamation of Black power rather than a fruitless attempt to affect immediate bureaucratic change. By demanding that Wilson explain himself, Trotter held the president personally responsible for federal segregation and the administration's betrayal of Black voters. Consequently, the Trotter-Wilson conflict was catalytic in radical New Negro political consciousness, even if it couldn't end segregation or change white democratic minds. It was a confrontation for colored people by colored people, as they called themselves, that introduced a different form of Black activism that was confrontational and unapologetic rather than pleading and compromising. The Blackness of Trotter's last confrontation with President Wilson is particularly evident given the fact that by the time Wilson agreed to meet with the League in November 1914, neither he nor his party had to pander to Black voters. The beginning of the European War in August and First Lady Wilson's death soon thereafter assured that few Americans, Black or white, cared what a Black Bostonian demanded of a sitting U.S. president. Additionally, the midterm elections were over and Democrats maintained control of both congressional houses, further proof to political analysts of both parties that colored voters were insignificant, as the New York Times stated. Wilson, like every other president before him, met white supremacist demands, perpetuated white American indifference, and further denied colored citizenship, all with little consequence or comment. President Wilson's penchant for racial paternalism, as well as virulent white supremacy, was on full display in his decision to meet with Trotter when he could have ignored him proves this. A pat on the head, progressive platitudes about fair play and Black uplift, and the Negro problem would go away, at once humbled and grateful for the opportunity. But William Monroe Trotter and his independent political lead were not interested in what white people thought or how Wilson would respond. His primary concern was for Black citizens who stood up against the Republican Party only to find themselves segregated, degraded, and humiliated for their defection. And so he opened his meeting with President Wilson by distributing copies of a resolution passed by the Massachusetts State Legislature. While Democrats gained seats in the federal Congress, in the Bay State, they lost three seats due to Black voters' rage at the Wilson administration. These losses meant that Governor of Massachusetts, David I. Walsh, a Democrat who owed his own election to Black voters in Boston's 18th Ward, pushed a measure through the state legislature that unanimously condemned Wilson's segregation policy. As Wilson and Secretary Tumulty looked over this condemnation, the league's president, Byron Gunner, described the history of Black federal employment and the unwillingness of previous Democratic and Republican administrations to introduce racial segregation. The other delegates, including Trotter, echoed Waldron's statements, then waited for the president to speak. Wilson's response echoed both the conservative racial uplift of the past 30 years, as well as the progressive racism of white reformers. According to the president, race was a human, not a political problem. And although the American people, quote, sincerely desire and wish to support in every way they can the advancement of the Negro race in America, they were also practical. We know, Wilson concluded, that there is a point at which there is apt to be friction between the races, and this is in the intercourse between them. He then co-opted the very language, independence, that the league that Trotter created used to foment Black political militancy, in Wilson's mouth, however, independence meant that Blacks must remain in their subordinate and proper place independently, he said, of civil rights. 
Segregation would accomplish this, Wilson concluded, since it was not meant to, quote, put the Negro employees at disadvantage, but to make arrangements which will prevent any kind of friction. And I will leave it there and open it up to questions. So this is the beginning of their confrontation. It is after this that Wilson tells um, Trotter and his league that they must leave the White House. He says that he will agree to meet with Negroes again, but only if you accept another spokesperson. And he dismisses them from the White House. And of course, segregation in the uh, federal government in Washington, DC continued uh, for an another generation. Thank you, Professor Greenidge. I, I want to, before we get into the, the Trotter and Wilson confrontation per se, um, I want to talk about Trotter himself and his thinking and the, his, his place in the sort of larger context of uh, Black civil rights activism, uh, or in some cases, what you might consider lack of activism um, among some of his contemporaries. I'm wondering first if you could explain a little bit more your concept of the genteel poor among African Americans and why that particular, if you could explain that constituency and why they were critical to, um, to Trotter's um, race first um, uh, politics that, that transcended the accommodationism of, of Booker T. Washington and the sort of talented 10th approach of W.E.B. Du Bois. Yeah, so thank you for the question. So Trotter was born in 1872, as I said before. He was the son of a Union Army lieutenant, one of only five black men commissioned to be a lieutenant in the Civil War. His father, James Trotter, became an appointee under Democratic President uh, Cleveland in 1880s um, and ended up earning his fortune in real estate. And so Trotter himself grew up pretty um, well off and privileged in the scheme of things as a young black man growing up in the last decades of the 19th century. Um, however, he grew up at a time when that black elite had a lot of contact, uh, family members, personal relationships with black people who might not have been of the same economic class, but definitely had the same aspirations. Um, the term genteel poor I use in the, in the book actually comes from his uh, Trotter's uh, contemporary and friend, Dorothy West, who was uh, another uh, daughter of the black elite, became a very famous black uh, writer in Boston. And she said that these people were the majority of black people in cities across the country. Um, they weren't the very, very poor, or if they were poor, um, they had the same aspirations as other members of the American middle class of all races. You know, they wanted to send their children to school. They wanted their children to go on to higher education, if possible. They um, um, read the newspaper rapidly. They were very, very up on politics. So they paid attention to local elections and national elections. Um, and they were very um, active in their dis discourse in terms of the politics of the time. And so those are the types of people that Trotter grew up around despite his elite black background. And so he really, when he started The Guardian, he started The Guardian in 1901, he graduated from Harvard in 1895. And in that six year period, he began to encounter for the, really the first time in his life, the limits of being a black person of respectability in a segregated um, and very virulently violent world. Um, at the time, if you were a graduate of Harvard, um, your hiring once you graduated went by your rank in the class. So the first five people, if you were the first five people in the rank, right, you were called up by all these famous firms and they would call you and, and basically you got the job right away. Trotter graduated third in his class and could not um, get a hearing with any firm in Boston, New York, or Chicago, which were the major cities where Harvard graduates went to. So it was the first time he really encountered what segregation was and is, right? And discrimination was and is. And through that, he began to see that part of the construction of this genteel poor was really had to do with the structures of the racism in society at the time, right? If you have a situation where somebody who was black who graduates third in their class from Harvard in 1895 can't get a job, what did that mean then if you had black people who were, you know, carpenters or who were laborers or who were, um, you know, storekeepers or barbers who couldn't get work, right? It had nothing to do with them as people and it had everything to do with the systems in which they lived. And so that's what he um, meant by the term genteel poor. And he really, when he started the newspaper, wanted to appeal to those people because he realized that those were the majority of people, right? Particularly black people in the North, right? Um, might not have money, 
right, might not have jobs, um, but that really had nothing to do with their political activism, their knowledge, their very sophisticated knowledge of how politics work, and their um, eagerness to participate and protest against the, the um, system in which they lived. Thank you. And, and kind of um, uh, wrapped up in his uh, outreach to and sense of identification with the genteel poor is also what you call his new Negro approach. Um, to politics. And I'm wondering if you could explain what that means as you use it, and also talk a little bit about how you kind of reconstruct or at least re-periodize that, that concept of, of the new Negro. Um, and why, and how is it different, uh, say, from uh, uh, a Booker T. Washington approach, a W.E.B. Du Bois approach, or let's say the approach of the predominantly white-led at this time, NAACP? Excellent, good question. So new Negro is a term um, that we traditionally think of as being termed by, uh, coined by Elaine Locke, um, the scholar and writer in the, in the uh, Harlem Renaissance in 1925. He comes out with a, a book called The New Negro that exposes sort of this flowering of black art and writing in the 1920s. Um, we know as scholars, and there's a great book by um, two great scholars, Henry Louis Gates Jr., obviously, and uh, Jean Jarrett, who came up with an anthology called The New Negro um, a couple of years ago. And that book really chronicles that this concept emerges after the Civil War. And it's this notion that you know, the days of Black people um, having to ask for and plead for their civil rights after uh, Reconstruction were gone, and that Black people had just as much rights as other people, um, that they should be proud of who they were, um, and that they were basically going to carve and define their political and cultural destiny for themselves. And traditionally, um, the New Negro movement has been identified with like the 1920s and the 19-teens. Um, present day scholars have, have veered away from that, you know, Devarian Baldwin, for instance, who teaches at Harvard and, and other, other scholars. I mean, really what I wanted to do was um, that um, this concept of a new Negro really emerges um, amongst Trotter's group of circle of people in that generation of black people who are born right after the Civil War. Right, and who grew up with parents who had been abolitionists and who had been very radically abolitionists. So Trotter's um, family, uh, maternal side of the family was involved in the Underground Railroad and his mother's earliest memory is of being eight years old and traveling with a musket in a carriage to transport fugitive slaves from Virginia slave state to Ohio, a free state. So there's a whole generation of young black people who grew up with that consciousness. Trotter is one of them. And so when I use the term new Negro, I really wanted to complicate our idea that somehow that emerges like in the 1920s. And somehow um, you didn't have black people as early as the 1870s who were um, confronting the um, conservative politics of a Booker T. Washington. And not just confronting Washington because they disagreed with his program for education, which is how Washington is often taught. Really, they disagreed with Washington because of his pandering to an accommodation for white supremacist violence. And I go through this a lot in the book in the beginning to say that Trotter, as much as he's been painted as somebody who you know disliked Washington and Washington was merely a Southern black man and Washington was trying to do the best with what he could. Trotter's main argument, I argue in the book, was that Washington himself recognized that the prescription he had for average black people wasn't working, right? And that in fact, um, you know, lynchings and very, very violent, virulent racial violence and segregation disfranchisement increased at the same time that Washington is talking about his program. And so Trotter would say that would indicate that um, Washington is not the best person to talk to Blacks about politics, right? And therefore, um, when he is held up as a hero, Trotter would say he's held up as a hero for white uh, progressives who really wanted to believe that, um, you know, all that needed to happen was Black people needed to work harder and study harder and get a leg up in the economy. And eventually they would become acceptable to white people in white society and they would be able to be granted the right to vote. And Trotter was main, um, main point was that that was hypocritical, that Black people knew that was not true, right? And so um, he would appeal to the genteel poor 
to say those people knew that it was not true because they were living the reality of it every day. Um, in terms of uh, Trotter's relationship to um, the cultivation of this consciousness of new Negro consciousness, he really believed that the consciousness was there, but because the press was being um, uh, or was so co-opted and controlled by these conservative interests that it wasn't being expressed. And that average black people, these genteel poor, actually disagreed with Washington. And he was, you know, it, it, all evidence points that he was correct about this, right? It, but that they had no place to express this because Washington and white conservatives controlled the press. Um, this was the uh, atmosphere that produced the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People that was founded in uh, 1909. And Trotter's disagreement with the NAACP was that it emerged at this moment. It emerged from mostly white and black progressives who still clung to um, the notion that um, racism and racial violence and disfranchisement and segregation were because black people were somehow objectionable to white people, as opposed to the fact that those were policies that were created um, in the aftermath of emancipation because white people um, did not like black people being free, right? And so he's really one of the first people to point this out and to say that you cannot have an, an organization, in this case, the NAACP, that fights for the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment if that organization doesn't acknowledge that the only reason we are not enforcing the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment is because white people do not like racial equality. And that has nothing to do with Black people's you know, um, acceptability or mm -hmm. um, ability to vote. I mean, so this was really kind of the heart of his and why I would call him a radical, because there really were not a lot of people um, who were expressing um, this view and were willing to call out and um, um, both this very, very small exclusive black elite that benefited in many ways from segregation um, in the South and the white progressives who um, sort of signed on to this through organizations like the NAACP. You know, one of the, one of the threads in, at least as I read, Trotter through your work, and also one of the threads, I think, in your book, uh, but in Trotter's discourse, is um, to, to put at the forefront of all of his advocacy and his encounters with whites or uh, racial conservatives among African Americans, that he and all of the genteel poor and African Americans generally should be very proud of their blackness, that there's not, there's no need to apologize for being black period, for any reason, you know, whether, whatever you associate with being black, whether it's some kind of economic status or educational attainment, there's, there's absolutely nothing, you know, it's to be black and, and proud to use a phrase from a later generation, um, which is why I think it, your argument that this really was a, a, a version of black radicalism is so persuasive. What's so fascinating to me though, and this is something you talk about often in your book too, is that he really preferred and almost always used the term colored rather than black because he felt it, well, maybe you can explain why yeah. and, and <laughs> I'll, you can do it much better than I can paraphrase. Yeah, it's a good question. So Trotter, and I, I, I'm very, uh, I took great care in the early chapters of the book to point out what the context was he was coming from. So Trotter um, grew up in Boston. And one of the things I did in the book was try to point out what blackness looked like to people outside of the South. Um, mm -hmm. And it isn't to knock the South in any way <laughs> or, or say that it's wrong, but it's to say, often we tend to think of black politics as being um, Northern versus Southern. We think of it as being recently emancipated uh, a formerly enslaved people in the South. And to get a broader picture of how those people in the South are influenced and influence Black radicalism, we have to account for the fact that, say, in the North, Blackness uh, did not mean that in 1865. Because number one, in a state like Massachusetts, Black people had been free since the 1790s, right? Black men, property holding Black men in Massachusetts could vote as early as 1787. And so there was a consciousness there that was very different politically. There's also a consciousness there that was very different than other parts of the country in Boston, in New York as well, um, and in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles, which is that the influence of black people who were born outside of 
the United States. So um, Boston um, is a city that historically has always had since the census of 1790, 10% of its black population is born overseas. And that's still true today. The numbers in 2010 are higher. They're about 33% of all black people in greater Boston are foreign born. Um, and so what this does and what I wanted to explore was what does that black people's view of blackness that's not based in the United States how does that shape how they grew up? So in Trotter's case, he grew up in a New England where his, his closest neighbors were Union Army veterans who were from England, right? So the other Black people he knew in his town in Hyde Park were Black people who spoke with a London accent, right, in the 1880s. And so part of when he sort of would argue that he used the term colored was that he said it was the way that it defined what blackness meant. And he would argue it was actually a much more global form of blackness, right? Because you had black people who were involved in his movement who were from Barbados and were who were from Cape Verde and who were from South America, right? And who were from Canada, right? And who were Caribbean and West African, right? And he was very conscious, very from a very early age that that was what he was fighting for. And that beyond just the United States, there was this global struggle and this was part of his um, argument with Wilson too. There was this gro global struggle of what he called the colored peoples of the world who were being exploited, right? Um, and that he really foresaw that that would develop as America became an empire, right? Is that you were you were exporting and creating um, this sort of what we now call sort of racial um, um, unrest throughout the rest of the world. So when he used the term colored, he really saw it as a revolutionary term and not exclusive. And actually many of his later followers, people like a, um, Marcus Garvey, for instance, was a Trotter fan, um, agreed with that term as well. He didn't use it as much. Um, uh, radicals in um, the Caribbean um, actually borrowed that term from him. And at the time period he lived, he really was considered radical because you were, you were were he was claiming that it meant that black people had this very, very diverse background, racial, ethnically, economically, nationally, um, and that that was what he was talking about when he was talking about um, Black and civil rights. Is there any overlap, I guess, philosophically, and maybe no one else cares about this, but mm -hmm. uh, other than me, but with Du Bois in that sense, and that Trotter seems both to recognize that race, at least, if not blackness, is a social contract, construct, but it, it's no less real for that reason. And so is he kind of walking that line then with his kind of pride in blackness, but his insistence on the kind of diversity and fluidity or variety or kind of blurry edges of what that term means? Or am I looking for connections that aren't there? No, I think you're absolutely right. Um, he and Du Bois, as I go into the book, had a long and very storied relationship. Um, du Bois actually courted the woman who Trotter ended up marrying. Um, so <laughs> Du Bois fell in love with this woman, beautiful woman, while they were in, while he was at Harvard. With Geraldine, was, with Deanie? Yes, Geraldine ended up marrying wow. Trotter. So Trotter was definitely, they had this very, very long relationship with one another very contentious um, as their careers both veered the other way. So they both, and they were both New Englanders. And so they both came from this um, space where they saw black people and blackness in this global context. And, you know, there's a lot of, of scholars, um, I'm just one of them, who's kind of started to look at this, right? How is it that, you know, if you're black and you grow up in a space in the United States, your conceptualization of blackness and politics is shaped by how blackness is where you, you come from, right? It seems pretty obvious, but it's kind of, um, people sort of haven't really looked at this um, in this way before. And so I would argue that Trotter and Du Bois and a lot of other activists of this late 19th century period, they were approaching race and politics from America and the virulent racism that was happening there, but also from the way America was affecting their specific communities, right? Um, Trotter, for instance, never knew a time when he couldn't vote in local elections, right? Which is pretty, if you think of that oh. as a black person, that's pretty um, um, phenomenal, right? Du Bois as well, except when he lived in um, Atlanta, lived in spaces where he could vote, right? And so then what does that do to the way then they look at the franchise and what, what they look at when someone like Wilson is elected and the assumption nationally is that, um, you know, segregation doesn't really matter because black people are segregated anyway, right? It's like, whoa, no, no, wait a second, right? Um, you have a whole generation of people who 
one day went to school and it wasn't segregated. And then two weeks later went to school and it was. And what does that actually feel and look like politically for that group of people? Fantastic. I, and I promise we are going to get to the Wilson <laughs> Trotter stuff. Um, but I think some of the audience um, comments are more focused on that. And, and I, I, you know, I want people to understand kind of the richness of, of Trotter, again, beyond the Oval Office. I, I'm curious about, um, and we'll also get to the anti-colonial and global um, mm -hmm. uh, questions too, but um, one of your points, uh, the, one of the points that you make in the book is, is the importance of the Black counter narrative that Trotter um, propagated in the media, as you've mentioned already in your comments today. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about, um, uh, talk about what that counter narrative was. I mean, I was struck, for instance, in your reading about the, the confrontation with Wilson that that at least at that moment, the focus was not so much on let's end the segregation policy. Not, not that it wasn't on that, but the main point was just to proclaim, um, you know, and promote a narrative of uh, empowered blackness, um, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the effect. Um, so I wonder if you could talk about his, the, the kind of counter narrative that he tried to mount and what it, you know, how you see it is directly relevant to today and to anti-racist politics today. Excellent. That's a, another, another good question. Um, well, one of the things I tried it's to It's a good book, out, so it's yes, easy to ask questions. <laughs> is, the, um, is his confrontation with Wilson took place in 1914. As I mentioned in the little excerpt I read, when he finally has his big blowout, it's right after the midterm. So, um, you know, there was really no reason for, to, for uh, someone who knew politics so well, Trotter, to... Um, go and see Wilson again, because he wasn't naive enough to think that he was going to get Wilson to suddenly say, oh my gosh, segregation is bad. Let's desegregate, right? That, yeah. That's not how, exactly. It's um, in my inbox. I'm sorry. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Oh my, oh my God, I'm so sorry, right? He was, that's not what his protest, and that's, and I would argue that's really not what the purpose of of a radical protest is, right? It's really not to change the minds of the person. Uh, it's really to point out the injustices and get those injustices fixed. And so Trotter really was very strategic in saying, um, look, Wilson, um, we are black people who are responsible for the reason why you won in certain Northern states, um, specifically Ohio, uh, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, right? Um, we are the ones who put you into office. As voters, we have the right to confront you when you basically do a complete 180 from what you told us before. And he and I didn't read the part where Trotter meets with Wilson and black voters meet with Wilson and Wilson promised to be the next Moses of the black people. So this wasn't something that was invented. So Trotter would say, sitting president, black people voted for you and you went against what black people, what you told us in the Oval Office or what you told us in New Jersey you would do. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I would argue that the confrontation and Trotter's politics was really more about saying Black people um, can be and are political agents within the political system that they live, even if you don't recognize it, right? Um, mm -hmm. The way this bears on today is that, you know, there's this argument that, um, you know, the 2020 elections, oh my goodness, Georgia, and how did that happen? And it's such an upset. Well, if you were somebody who had been paying attention to black politics and particularly black women's politics in Georgia um, since 2016, it wasn't necessarily a surprise because you're, you're looking at that population mobilizing and having much more of a say in uh, politics locally and nationally than people often give those communities credit for. And so Trotter really recognized that. I do a lot in the book of talking about how he really was also sending a message to Massachusetts uh, Congress people. Mm -hmm. Massachusetts at the time um, was one of those states that was considered ironically a swing state because you often had elections where the public would vote for say a national candidate who was a Democrat or a Republican, but locally they would vote. So they would split their votes, right? And so um, Trotter was very cognizant of saying, look, Massachusetts people who are in office, you are losing votes by the fact that you're ignoring what black people in your state 
are saying about Wilson, right? And, and that's true. What, what ended up happening by the 1920s is that the state then flipped to be Republican when mm -hmm. Democrats kind of had this window and they lost. There's a lot of evidence that it had to do with where they lost was where Black people were, uh, despite their small numbers, were deciding vote. And so Trotter was really big on pointing that out to Black people and Black voters, which was that, look, this whole notion that somehow Black people don't have a political effect right, that Black people are so disfranchised um, that really they're a factor out of politics, which was kind of the rhetoric of the time. He would say, well, yes, that's true, but if you don't live in the South, Black people are migrating to these areas where they still can vote, and they can have a very big effect on local politicians mm -hmm. who want to make the name for themselves on the national stage. And so um, that's a very sophisticated argument that Trotter would make, and it's also very much a way to plant these seeds, which he saw, of showing and telling and urging and telling black people that they were more powerful than um, the rhetoric would have them believe, right? Um, and that they could have effect on national politics. I think it's sophisticated too, in the sense that it's a, he takes sort of a both and approach. It's not just that he, um, it's not that he's not a, a sort of pragmatist in the sense of trying to affect particular electoral outcomes or particular policies in very specific strategic ways, uh, as your comments on his relationships with, with his own Massachusetts congressional delegation and local officials demonstrate or, or suggest. Um, but he also sees the simultaneous value of and need for um, this radical protest that is about I mean, is it for him about larger narrative change or is it about just sort of sustaining the sort of courage and will of black people or, you know, um, is it both? Um, I, would, I would say it would, it was, it's both. I think that definitely um, Trotter's ability to mobilize large groups of people to make politicians pay attention was a skill, right? And yeah. even today, when we think of we think of that, when people have protests, and sometimes there's 20 people, and sometimes there's 3,000 people. But Trotter was very big on constantly being known as, if you're going to pass a piece of legislation, and you don't want a swarm of people to show up yelling at you, you know, you it makes you think first. Now, did that mean right. that every single time he showed up, that the politician then changed their mind? It didn't. But what it meant was that you ended up building this consciousness amongst people so that mm -hmm. then they would carry that into other protests. And so you would get right. things like by the 1940s, the March on Washington movement that effectively leads to the desegregation of, of the uh, military in 1948, right? Um, a Philip Randolph was a Trotter disciple, right? And learned how to mobilize people from Trotter and by attending these protests. And you would say, you know, look, sometimes you'd show up, there'd be lots of people, sometimes there would be no people. But the idea that people should mobilize um, is something that was like this through line from, you know, the 1890s up through the 1950s and 1960s. Yeah, and your chapter on the, on the birth of the nation and how these sort of protests against that movie were popping up in places, obviously without his orchestration. Um, yeah. it, it sort of was, um, it sort of, again, proves that point that if you build the consciousness, um, then some of those people take that consciousness and that example out into their own communities and their own circles yeah. uh, or wider circles. Um, well, so let's let's turn to, uh, to the Wilson Trotter um, uh, confrontation, and then we'll circle back, I think, to a couple other larger questions about Trotter's career. Um, so uh, there was a, a, a question in the, um, from the audience, and um, this is something that uh, comes up very, very often in the scholarship, not just around the Wilson Trotter confrontation, but on um, this particular moment in the Democratic Party in the United mm -hmm. States. And that is, um, you know, you know, wasn't Wilson just, you know, accommodating the fact of the solid South? Um, and I don't necessarily want to litigate that question. Mm -hmm. But some of what you've said before kind of leads me to believe that um, Trotter sort of understood that Wilson was um, accommodating the solid South. He had other priorities that he set went far above, um, you know, shamefully far above the civil rights of um, the 500,000 people who voted for him and all the other African-Americans in the country. Um, 
and I guess it sort of gets back to sort of my earlier question. Trotter seems very adept at kind of holding two strategies or approaches or 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 whatever in his mind at once. Um, I mean, he doesn't seem, um, despite Wilson's like kind of very petulant, you know, how dare you take this tone with me and get out of my office. He doesn't seem particularly um, bitter toward Wilson or all that entirely surprised by November 1914. Um, and yet he does make a very strong point of confronting Wilson with uh, the consequences of uh, the segregation of um, the treasury, uh, the postal service, et cetera. So um, can you help us understand maybe a way to understand this, their, this situation that um, gets beyond the sort of tired old, well, Wilson, Wilson couldn't have done anything or else he couldn't have pushed through his new freedom or, or Wilson um, you know, should have immediately acted uh, to halt segregation, not only in the federal government, but everywhere else. And shed a little bit more light on how Trotter used this moment um, as part of a longer game, I guess, uh, in the civil rights movement. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, one one of the things um, that Trotter pointed out, and that many of his followers and supporters, um, and even detractors pointed out, was that the way to get to a point where you have a democratic president and the argument is the only way he can push through his ideas is to accommodate the South. They would say, well, that's because of the failures of not upholding the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, right? <laughs> right. So yeah. it's like, it's like, you know, well, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but yeah, that might be true. But you know, if you had um, you know, a an effort by going all the way back to the 1890s, 1880s of upholding these amendments, you wouldn't have to accommodate the white South. The only reason you have to accommodate the white South is because you've disfranchised, you know, 95% of black voters, right? And the only reason um, that was able to happen was because there was this like, just kind of, we'll just disenfranchise black voters, right? Right, right? And so that was really their their broader point. And so it would be irrelevant that um, to Trotter and to many of his supporters and, and attractors who are black would be like, well, but it's irrelevant whether or not he can right. or can't, right? Really what we're talking about is this broader issue of how it is we got to a moment where um, the only way a candidate could run in the South um, was to be a Democrat. And that was a choice that Republicans and Democrats made over like a 20 year period, right? Um, there was no reason that it should be a solidly Democratic South. The only reason it was, was because you disenfranchise the majority of the people who live there. And so that's that's really sort of, and if you read Trotter's stuff, I mean, that's what he's what he's saying. And so part of his approach to a Wilson um, is an approach where I, th- that I think, you know, more broadly, we should look at um, activists during this time is that they're really playing the long game and they're really arguing for something bigger than the moment. Um, mm-hmm. There's no evidence that, tr- that Trotter thought that, Woodrow Wilson would be a savior for black people when he had told black people to vote for him. On the contrary, Trotter was arguing that black people should vote for Wilson because the Republican Party had allowed disfranchisement. And he believed that it was a way to vote for in 1912, a candidate that nobody knew anything racially about. Now that might seem hard for us to realize now that we know what we know about Wilson. But Wilson, when he's running for president in 1912 was known as a progressive, right? He was not known as somebody who had taken a stand either way publicly and politically on black rights, right? He was known as the guy who met with black voters in New Jersey who wanted to ask him about being a Democrat, right? And so from a black perspective, again, we have to look back at the time period. People only know what they know at the time. He would seem like, okay, we're not coming here to ask you to give us anything as black people. We're asking you to address the fact that we can't vote and that there's rampant lynching. And many of those lynchings are taking place by people who are Democrats in office in the South, many of whom uh, Wilson then appoints to his cabinet. Uh, the, the, uh, his his uh, delegation from Texas are made up of two people who are involved in the lynching. I mean, this is not like small stuff, but, but Trotter doesn't know this at the time, right? <laughs> Trotter basically is saying, 
you know, he is the lesser of the evils that we have, which was the Republican Party. I go through all this, this in the book of sort of the relationship of the right. Republican Party. And so when Wilson gets elected and the first thing he does, and I point out in the book, this is within three weeks of him being elected. So it's not as if there's like a conversation or, oh my goodness, what should I do? This is literally, uh, he's elected in March. Trotter gets on the train to go back to Boston after attending a black parade for Wilson's honor. And within two days, delegates from Texas come in and basically furrow this rumor that says black men are raping white women in the streets of Washington. So very horrendous stuff, right? And so Trotter is saying, you know, and his followers and supporters were saying, you know, it's not as if this is a surprise, this type of racism, but we are voters and we are citizens, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so as citizens and voters in a democracy, you have the, your job is to confront the people who are supposed to represent you, right? Um, and if they don't do what you want, you then vote them out of office, right? So this right. would be Trotter's point is like, why is this not computing? So, so we have to kind of have to get away from the fact that it's just Trotter going and being mad at Wilson because, oh my God, he's segregating and how could he segregate the government? Right. It's right. more, Wilson is a president who, yes, he segregated the government, but he's president precisely because and I go through this in the book, right? He got a lot of Northern black, black people to vote for him, right? Mm -hmm. And that's his constituency as much as the white people who voted for him, right? Do you want to, I wanna talk about um, how Trotter's internationalist views and uh, kind of ideals and Wilson's uh, either overlap or don't, but do, do you wanna take some time to talk a little bit about uh, Trotter's uh, and, and many other people's sort of beef with the Republican party because I think yes. the simplistic narrative is that, um, you know, um, you know, the Republicans, you know, had, um, well, had been so, so great to black yes. people and, uh, oh, it's too bad that, you know, uh, the Democrats came in and all of a sudden it was horrible for everybody. And, and yes. really it's a much more complicated uh, story. Yes. than yes. Yeah. So, so just, just briefly, you know, um, Black um, defection from the Republican Party began as early as um, underneath Grant in the 1860s because, um, for two reasons, one was uh, the idea that Grant supported um, and gave countenance to monetary policies that were destructive to people who were laborers, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we think that the majority of Black people are laborers and majority of them are living in rural areas in the South, uh, many of the policies that were passed by the Republican administration in the 1870s um, were detrimental to that class of people. So there's inklings of Black people being very disappointed um, with, with what they saw as the Republican Party turning their back on the Negro, which is what um, uh, T. Thomas Fortune, a, a Black newspaper editor, put it. Um, and by the 1880s, there was a movement amongst Black people, including Trotter's father, to create and to align themselves with um, Cleveland, um, who ran on uh, basically this monetary policy um, that argued against the gold standard is sort of mm -hmm. too long to get into, but you know, yeah. this, higher this inflation, that, looser credit, exactly. better for exactly. debtors than, than yeah. Right. And so there were many, many black people who said, look, black people are uh, laborers and they're uh, workers and they are people who purchase, right? And so your monetary policies, Republicans, directly affect those people, right? And so there was there were these inklings of it. It's why the Democratic Party locally in states like New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, Massachusetts began to win on state grounds it was because you had a very small alliance with black migrants um, and white uh, immigrants from Europe who were against these type of policies. And so by the time you get to the 1890s, when you have the rise of, of, of um, segregation and disfranchisement, so Southern states go and they rewrite their state constitutions to specifically disfranchise Black people. A lot of that occurred in the aftermath and in the, with the countenance of the Supreme Court, all of whom justices were appointed by Republican people. So Black people are saying, we have this Republican Party that gives um, um, uh, lip service to Black equality. So the Republican Party would appoint various Black people to uh, appointments in the government. But at the same time, you have um, the Republican Party um, in many ways sacrificing Black votes in the South. And so mm -hmm. Theodore Roosevelt in particular and William McKinley in particular were two of the people who, who coined what they called their Southern strategy. At the time in the 1890s, what they meant by that was that they were going to build 
white Republican support. And they were going to do that by um, uh, promising to disenfranchise and discountenance right. Black voters. And so Black people had this long history before Wilson came of really questioning and um, uh, criticizing the Republican Party. You have as early as 1892, Black people showing up and wanting to vote for William Jennings Bryant, Bryan and, and showing up at that uh, at the Democratic you know, um, convention and wanting to do that. Um, so so it, it goes all the way back to the 1880s and 1890s. And by the time Wilson was, was elected, you had Black people in the North who voted and split their votes like most Americans. Um, we're kind of in a weird time now where this doesn't happen. Split their votes amongst parties. So you might vote Democratic for yeah. the mayor and then naturally you vote for Republicans. And this was really what Trotter wanted people to do. He wanted you to think about your vote, right? And think about the fact that you were voting for what was best for your race of people and for yourself as a black person, as opposed to, you know, this person walks in a Lincoln parade and right. <laughs> talks about how they oppose slavery, but it's 1895 and they have nothing else to say about you know, civil rights. Um, so yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. I think we've gotten into this narrative um, that was pushed like in the thirties and forties, which is that you know, black people somehow, you know, oh my goodness, Roosevelt came in and black people were now democratic. And that really yeah. oversimplifies and also sort of relies on this narrative that somehow black people were asking for something from the government, which Trotter was always like, no, we're not asking for anything, right? Yeah. These things are actually in the, in the constitution. Right, right. So uh, thank you very much. Um, so let's go to Trotter's, uh, well, how would you describe it? Internationalist thought, anti-colonialist thought, all of it. Uh, what was his, how did he see his um, work at home, let's say, interlocking with uh, campaigns all across the world, led by people all across the world um, of various races, but especially in the African diaspora, um, you know, what were his attitudes toward um, the League of Nations or various similar types of proposals? Um, you know, tell us that, I mean, I, I don't think, you know, he's as well known for his, um, for his activism in, in that area as he is as a domestic civil rights advocate. So tell us about Trotter and the world. Bit. Yeah, so Trotter in 1919 is the only African American person to arrive in Europe as they're, uh, he gets there late, <laughs> as they're hashing out the, uh, the League of Nations and the terms at the end of World War I. He's the only one to go who is representing Black people themselves. So there's the Pan African Conference, Congress, which occurs. That is controversial uh, for Black people uh, across the world at the time because that was actually um, motivated in part by uh, elites within the colonial Black diaspora. And I go to this, mm -hmm. this in the book, and there's other historians have done a lot of work on this, you know, um, that that first, that Pan-African Congress where Du Bois goes, Du Bois goes because he's sent there by the NAACP. And so your average Black person, um, working class person, genteel poor, both in the United States and in London and in, you know, uh, Jamaica, West, Indies, and, West yeah. Indies were saying, why is the white power structure picking the people who get to go to this conference, right? Um, if you're talking about self-determination, shouldn't these people be elected, right? Um, and shouldn't they have those elected officials then show up at this conference? And so Trotter um, has this thing called the Liberty Congress in which he uh, gets black people from all over the country and um, the Caribbean as well. So his newspaper was, was sold overseas to elect people they want to go to um, uh, France. And he is the one who ends up going. Uh, the Wilson administration's response is to suspend all um, passports for Black people leaving the country, and unless they were with aligned with the NAACP. And so Trotter got to Paris because he disguised himself as a um, as a laborer on a ship and ended up getting to France. He gets to Versailles a week after the, <laughs> the um, treaty is signed. But in that time, and while he was in Paris, he ended up distributing what he called the claims of the colored people, which was signed by thousands of black and people of color across the United States, Caribbean, South America, telling their claims of what they saw for the new world order. And what they saw unequivocally was an end to colonialism in their countries, right? Um, 
immediately, right? And mm -hmm. at the time, of course, the idea is that even with the Pan-African Congress, which was conference uh, in 1919, the idea was that if that were to happen, it should happen over a period of decades, right? Um, there was then, um, you know, well, we can't have this happen because uh, how else will you get uh, France and England to the table to just construct this new world right. order? And so Trotter, uh, really, as a result of that trip, for Black people across the diaspora became this folk hero because he's the only one who shows up and says, no, what Black people and people of color want is not what Du Bois is saying at the Pan-African Congress, mm -hmm. right? What Black people and people of color want is immediate um, emancipation and able to self-govern themselves, right? And particularly at a moment when the rhetoric is that people should be able to govern themselves, right? 14 points, all of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Why are we the ones who are not allowed to express ourselves and say that that's what we want? And so um, by the 1920s, Trotter is part of um, a movement, a very diasporic movement um, of Black people urging um, uh, massive protests against colonial governments in uh, the Caribbean and um, um, in um, parts of Africa, right? Even though he himself is in the United States and his career kind of is declining mm -hmm. at the point, he definitely is, an, is somebody who encourages that and argued that um, his form of internationalism, he would say, was for the colored people of the world and not for, um, and not merely for kind of the elite of the world. Does he see value in the League of Nations project or versions of it, um, despite its imperfections, I mean, despite its, you know, what, what Wilson and others would say, it's inevitable kind of accommodation to European imperial sort of priorities. Um, does he see, a, a, you know, Du Bois saw some long term sort of hope uh, in, in the project, uh, as a forum in which um, uh, you know, to bring the the plight of African Americans before the shocked conscience of the world, and there's a, you know a lot of scholarship that shows that in many cases the league did serve that kind of publicity generating function, especially in Palestine and the Middle East. Um, did Trotter see any value um, to that, or um, or was he was he cold on it? Oh no, he was he was very he believed in. Um, so right when after he turned returned from Paris, he actually uh, testified before the Senate in the United States right. about the 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 League of Nations having a, an ability to be a voice on an international stage for America's abuses of its own people. So he was very much a part and believed in that and would have agreed with um, Du Bois in that. So it wasn't as if he was somebody who said, you know, the League of Nations needs to be gotten rid of. Um, right, but he right. was somebody who said that the way the world order was crafted by 1920, 1921, merely reinforced um, what he would call sort of the American project at home and helped transfer it overseas into other, uh, into other um, countries. And that, that exacerbated sort of these colonial projects um, in the rest of the world. So in that way, he was very much, you know, of his generation of black internationalists who, who um, were ambivalent about the role of the League of Nations. But again, Trotters would um, very presciently say that, you know, um, Wilson's ability to create the League of Nations um, was precisely the thing that made the Re League of Nations problematic, right? What does it mean that you have somebody who has these virulently racist views of people in the world that he's creating and designing the world order? And Trotter would say, you know, we need to really think about what that means, right? Um, even if the League of Nations concept itself and what it does um, is something that Trotter would say is a powerful and good thing, what does it mean if the vessel of that thing comes from this place of somebody who has and holds um, this, this, this view in the world. So he was definitely somebody who was in, in tune to nuance, right? And the fact, and, and, and what that actually means long-term, right? Did, did he see the American racist project at home as fundamentally different from the projects, the racist projects overseen by European world leaders who I would argue were equally or more racist um, certainly more, um, um, well, anyway, I, I mean, did he see a major difference between the American racist project and, and those of other 
global powers that were shaping the post-war settlement, or did he see it as them kind of as all of a, a piece? He saw them all of a piece, and in that, in, in given his time period, he would have been um, correct in the sense that he was alive at the moment when he saw a lot of racial scientists who went to Harvard and Yale and, and, and Princeton um, become very, very popular in Europe. And then mm -hmm. their ideas become the ideological basis for policy in Lothrop the Lothrop Stoddards, the Lothrop Stoddards yes, of the right? world. And so we have yeah. to remember Trotter was born in 1972. So he knows, and he's in that elite circle. He knows who these people are, right? He knows mm -hmm. that when, you know, Madison Grant is writing The Passing yeah, of the Great mm -hmm. Race, he, know, he knows that book, right? He knows the people who read it. And he knows many of his people he went to college with who now are over creating policy who studied those works. So for him, it was a very real thing. It wasn't like an abstract, oh, you know, American racism informs European imperialism and European uh, colonialism informs American racism. He was seeing it develop in real time, right? Um, and he was seeing how the ideas that were ideas when he was like a child became policy by the time policy. he was an adult. Yeah. And so that was something that was very, um, and again, for this generation of people was pretty visceral, right? As mm -hmm. is seeing, oh, it's an idea, um, you know, social Darwinism. And then, oh my goodness, by 1919, that person who was espousing that is now the head of, you know- Head of eugenics. Um, at exactly. Some, like, for some city, yeah. Exactly, right. exactly. Um, so I wanna talk about, uh, thank you very much. That's. Um, that's really, really helpful. Um, I want to talk about, um, you know, um, <laughs> I'm a Woodrow Wilson scholar, so I know that historical figures can be very complicated and um, contradictory. <laughs> and so I want to ask you about Trotter's chauvinism or sexism. I yes. mean, how does his uh, women never lead dictum yes. uh, fit into his anti-elitist, populist um, conception of democracy and his strategy for achieving it when you know a lot better than I or anyone else on this call, it seems to me that um, the, the role of African-American women in civil rights and, and what we might now call community organizing, civic organizing was so important at the time. Um, how does that fit in or doesn't it? Is it just one of those, he's a person of his time, place, upbringing, um, can you talk a little bit about his views on gender and, and yes, well, as, as, as a historian, I never use like somebody's a person of their time, but I would say he's so, so, um, and I touch on this in the book, particularly his relationship with his wife and his sisters and his mother mm -hmm. is so Trotter was a, a misogynist. Um, he was very, um, um, somebody who benefited from the fact that his sisters and then his wife, um, were forced to put a lot of their lives on hold to make sure that this project, um, The Guardian, came to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, he was um, very, even more misogynistic than men of his time. So when Du Bois is constructing the Niagara movement and Du Bois is saying women should be part of this movement, it's Trotter and he's the only one who says no. Right. And so in that way, he's very he's much more um, um, sh uh, male chauvinistic than even his contemporaries were. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that it. It points out the fact that. His weakness as a long term um, figure as having mm -hmm. a legacy, I think, is due to many things not the least of which is that he was this very, very difficult person. Prickly and is the adjective that keeps popping up. Is difficult, yes. <laughs> I'll put it, <laughs> lead you to the book, yes. But, but the fact that he was so um, entrenched in his own views of Black women, even when others in his generation were not, I think took a toll on his legacy as it should have, right? Right, is that, you know, when you have a Du Bois and you have a James Weldon Johnson and you have all these figures who were misogynistic in their own way, but would say, okay, women, black women are part of the struggle and Trotter comes to that much later, mm -hmm. um, that is gonna sacrifice his, his, uh, his sort of public memory. Um, I would also say that like many misogynists, he was somebody who did not function very well when women were not running the Guardian. So his wife, there's a lot of evidence that <laughs> yeah. the business of the Guardian, the business of himself 
was all maintained by his wife, that she basically um, was the one who made sure the paper got out, that made sure subscriptions, all these stuff. And once she died, the quality of that paper pretty much overnight goes south. And I, you know, there's not a lot of direct evidence. There is a lot of correlation of that that had a lot to do with her as a, as a, as a um, manager. Um, likewise, when his mother died, his whole managing of his own finances went out the window and his mother, you mm -hmm. know, was the one who managed all of the family money and, and mm -hmm. he was sort of not very kind to her and then she died. So I think it's a lesson in, rather than saying, you know, he is somebody who was a misogynist and that misogyny um, distracts from him. I would say like Wilson, who was a racist, what does it mean that you have a racist constructing American foreign policy and American imprint on the world, right? Likewise, what does it mean that you have a misogynist um, creating this radical black consciousness and he's a misogynist, right? Mm -hmm. That is a much more answer. So the real question is how, how, does, how does that person get there? Yes, how do they get uh, and, there? And what does that say about the society at large? And The society at large in which they live and the fact that, you know, your, it should become part of his legacy that this is what he was, was that he was somebody right, right. who didn't include women at the same time that women are the ones running the newspaper, right? right. Um, and the ones managing um, his schedule and making sure he's, you know, right, writing right. and producing stuff, yep. Um, we have just a few more minutes left. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about, you may or may not have heard that we're living in some kind of, um, new populist and somewhat sort of dystopian populist moment. Um, it's not, I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Wilson Center. I'm just saying uh, uh, mm -hmm. um, that that concern is abroad. Um, but you do portray Trotter as a very effective populist and a populist from whom, um, despite all his flaws, um, we can really learn. So what is the, the nature and sort of the value of his brand of populism versus um, the type of populism um, that that we see and, and and to which we we are kind of now habituated to apply that that term. What 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 can we gain from Trotter's populism? Is it a more is it a more democratic form of populism? And if so, how is it a more pragmatic form of populism? And if so, how is it a more civically grounded rather than um, high politics focused populism and if so how what, what, what can we what can we gain um, from studying Trotter's politics so Trotter was a populist in the sense that um, he really believed that the genteel poor so the average person um, should be able to dictate um, their own, um, benefits and um, role within the Republic. Um, and that that should not be dictated by people of power. So in that way, he was very much a pure populist. He would definitely be somebody who would say, you know, um, in contemporary America 2021, we're not really in a populist movement if certain movements are being controlled and financed mm -hmm. by uh, bigger players, right? right? That was his that was his con his criticism of Washington, right? So people were saying, oh, Booker T. Washington is so popular. Look at all the people who are coming to his speeches. Well, Trotter would point out, well, they're going to his speeches because they're being told lies, right, by the press. <laughs> and they are going to his speeches because they're being um they're being manipulated into going there, right? That's not actual populism, he would say, right? He mm -hmm. would say that that's manipulation. Mm -hmm. um, by an elite of people who are, are not in the elite. And so he was definitely somebody who would say, look, um, people need number one, a um, press that tells them what is actually happening and frames it in terms of what is really going on on the ground. And then the people will use that press and see the reality of that to make their decisions, right? And he was definitely somebody who did not believe it. It's kind of akin to now where he, his newspaper, The Guardian, and part of the reason he lost all his fortune was, was populist in the sense that he did not take money from any kind of outside sources. Mm -hmm. 
he refused to take, um, so the way the press worked at the time, particularly black press, was that you would get, if you ran a black newspaper, you'd get like a, a wealthy businessman, the Carnegie's, the Rockefellers should give you money, and they would be able to then run your agenda, right? Mm -hmm. And he refused that, even though many, many times people were, were coming in and saying, oh, Trotter, we'll give you like $10,000, you know, this is 1902 money um, right. to write a newspaper. And he would say, no, because you're going to be able to then dictate what it says. His, right. And so he was very true to that. Um, and so I think in that sense, he was the truest kind of populist in the sense that he did not believe, he believed that people had to make their decisions, but that that had to be an informed decision that was based in fact. Um, and he mm -hmm. was very big when he started The Guardian that part of the problem was, is that American public was not getting the fact about lynchings and segregation and uh, disfranchisement and what was actually happening in cities and all these type of things. Um, and that his goal as a newspaper man was, as he said, to hold a mirror up to nature using the, the, the statement from Shakespeare, right? You have to, your job is just to reflect what is happening, right? You don't editorialize. He had a page where he editorialized, but that was the only place. And he took all of these different reports from black communities and then put them in the newspaper um, and let people kind of see what was actually happening. So in that sense, he would say that you cannot have a truly populist movement if you don't have a truly um, popular press that actually mm -hmm. is reflective of the people. He was very big that he would not accept, one of the things he did, he did that was kind of contrary to his misogyny was that he had women write for his newspaper all the time because mm -hmm. he said, well, as a yeah. man, I don't know what's happening with women, right? misogynistic. Also, it meant that the Guardian actually had all of these, this rich treasure trove of what was happening with Black right. women in cities and in communities right. across the country that nobody else was reporting on. And he would say he had to do that because he was a newspaper reporter, right? And mm -hmm. so he was hiring people to write about things that he knew nothing about and wasn't going to editorialize about. It sounds like, I mean, it sounds a little bit like you're describing a form of populism. And I think there are strands of this in, you know, the Grange and the people's party too, that not that, not that it does not, not that he was not focusing attention on injustice and uh, betrayals and, but essentially it was less a grievance based populism than a really kind of asset focused, mm -hmm. you know, have faith in the capacities of the average people oh, yes. um, yes. to to build a better commons together, to build a better life together. Um, yeah. And I think that's, um, I think that's an important tradition. I think, I think there are multiple uh, kind of um, uh, analogous strands in the American political tradition of that kind of populism. And I think it's really, really helpful to, to see that um, lifted up during this period as well. Well, Professor Greenidge, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to end, I like to end a few minutes early usually because, um, you know, people have lives off screen yes. and maybe have to do something before their next Zoom starts at 2.30. So um, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for your book. Again, it is Black Radical, The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter, 2019. Um, and we're very glad to have had you with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you to the Wilson Center. This was great. So thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you next time.